This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com Baruch HaMabayim, welcome everyone. Shalom Aleichem, great to see everybody. This is our uh, special shir on the Yom Tif of Purim. Haba Aleinu Letoiva. So the let us begin. I have a good news to tell you. The Haggadah Shal Pesach is submitted. It is going to print. Last chance, if you would still like to participate in publication. Uh, let's see, I could show you a little preview of what it's going to look like. Let's see if I could put it up on the screen. Show you a little preview of what the cover is going to look like. For those of you who are watching, let's see. Um, Okay, let's get this up. Do you see it? No, just see the source sheet right now. Okay, oh, one second. Here. How's this? You see it? Yes. You see it in big? Yes. Okay, so this is uh, the cover. And Bezos Hashem, uh, hopefully it's going to print. Final editing is being done. And this is what it's going to look like, Bezos Hashem. Okay, so we have a very important topic today on uh, Megillah's Esther. Actually, I was at a bris this morning and the Moyal came over to me and he asked, you know, he has a question on the Megillah. He's asked many, many people and he doesn't have a satisfying answer. I said, okay, with that introduction, uh, let's give it a shot. So he said, you know, the whole Megillah, Achashosh is busy. Esther, whatever you want, I'll give you anything you want. The only thing I can't give you is Ad Chatsi HaMalchus. I can't give you the temple. Okay? And then all of a sudden, Haman is knocked off, and he says to her, Esther, whatever you want! What happened with that, that old rhetoric of Ad Chatsi HaMalchus? It's gone, it's out the window. And how, did, how did he just change on a dime? The whole Megillah, he's willing to give her anything except for the Beis HaMikdash. And all of a sudden now Haman is gone and he's happy to give her the Beis HaMikdash. I mean, how did he just turn on a dime like that? I said, look, you caught me with the right question. I think uh, we, I have some very nice information about that. And then I decided, you know what, let's talk about that subject this morning. So I want to share with you this morning 10 questions on Megillah Sester. And the good news is, even though there are 10 questions, all you have to do is give one answer. Um, all we have to do is offer one answer. So here it goes. So the Pasuk says like this. By the way, um, if you say, why do I keep on laning? First of all, I like to lane. You know, I also am allowed to have some fun. But, you know, last night I went to a Vart and I met a Rav and he told me that his kids listened to the Shurim and then when I came to speak by the Rav Shul, the kid asked, Tati, is he going to lane? So, you know, even though I was thinking of stopping laning, when I heard that, I decided that I have to continue laning because uh, maybe somebody, he likes to, the Tame HaMikra. Anyway, here's the thing. The Pasuk says that... Uh, the king says to Esther, what would you like? Ad chatsi hamalchos, up to half of the kingdom. And the Gemara Darshans, the Megillah Tesvav HaMabes, Vayyar Merla HaMelech, Lesser Maka, Ma Ba Koshoseich, Ad chatsi hamalchos v'seyas. So the Gemara asks, chatsi hamalchos v'loi kol hamalchos? He's only going to give her up to half the kingdom, not the whole kingdom. V'loi davar, so the Gemara Darshans, V'loi davar shechoitz it's in the malchos. Not something that splits the kingdom in half. Umayin Nihu, what is that? Binyan Beis Hamikdash, the building of the temple. The building of the temple. Now, 
Ask Rav Yonis and Ibeshitz, and I want to present the question as follows. Achashverosh had no, has no idea who this woman is. He doesn't think that she's Jewish. I mean, if he thought she was Jewish, that would be a skandal shein kamayu. He keeps on asking her, tell me, who are you? Esther doesn't spill the beans. Achashverosh has no idea who she is. Now, who did Achashverosh think she was? I would say very simply that, you know, why did Haman never suspect who Esther was? Chassam Soifer learns, based on the Gemara, that um, Esther found favor in everyone's eyes. The Gemara Darshan, nidma like umasai, to every individual, Esther appeared like a member of his nation. For each to each person, Esther thought that she was one of them. So the Chinese thought she was Chinese, Japanese thought she was Japanese, North Koreans thought she was North Korean, and Haman thought she was an Amalekia. That's why Haman never suspected she was Jewish. So I would add, what did Achashverosh think? Achashverosh thought she was a uh, Persian. Achashverosh thought she was Persian. Ah, oh, that's why Achashverosh never suspected she was a Jew. So I have a question. He's marrying a nice Persian girl. He says, she has a request. He says, honey, whatever you want. Just not the base Hamikdash? Where did Achashverosh get this ludicrous idea that his wife, who in, as far as he's concerned, is a Persian, will want to ask for the base Hamikdash? I mean, that's like saying, I'll give you whatever you want, just not the Panovich uh, Litzirim. I mean, he's talking to a Persian woman. Why would she ask for the base Hamikdash? That is question number one. Question number two, Rabbi Isai, is the question that we started off with. And the entire Megillah, Achashverosh is busy with, not the Beis HaMikdash, not the Beis HaMikdash, whatever you want, not the Beis HaMikdash. And the moment that Haman is hanged, Achashverosh drops the whole Beis HaMikdash. Mikdash hang up. He's not hung up about the base of Mikdash anymore. He says now, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Seemingly, by the end of the story, Achashverosh has flip-flopped, and now he's willing to build the base of Mikdash. I don't understand this guy. He's out of his mind. The whole story, I mean, how does he start off the, part, the story? The story of the Megillah begins, Achashverosh is celebrating the eternal ruin of the Beis HaMikdash. He's busy telling her, but not the Beis HaMikdash. And then Haman is hanged, and he flip-flops, and he forgets about it. I mean, this man should run for office. He would be a good politician. What happened to the guy? He's out of his mind. Now, let's start with the beginning of the story. He's making a party. How long? He makes a party for another seven days. So he makes, he's making a 187 day party. By the way, Manas Halevi says it was a 192 day party. Yamim is two days. Rabim is three days. So on 180 days, then two days, then another three days, then another five, eight, uh, then another seven days. What's this man so happy about? So the Gemara says that Yermia said, that at the end of the seven years, God will remember us. And lo and behold, It's really amazing that Achashverosh is celebrating the fact that the Beis HaMikdash is not being rebuilt. Could somebody tell me please, why is a man so happy that the Beis HaMikdash is not being rebuilt? Does it really interfere with his daily life if there is or is not a Beis HaMikdash? Would the Jewish people be less loyal to him? 
of what relevance is it? Why would a man be so happy that the Beis HaMikdash is not being rebuilt to the extent that he made the longest party in the history of mankind? I mean, what's wrong with him? Why does he, why is it relevant to him that the temple is not rebuilt? Why is Achashverosh so enthused about the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash that he made a party, Shmoinim Ma'as Yoim? That is question number three. Question number four. The Gemara Megillah on Daf Yudalid. It's number six on your sheet. Let's take a look. We'll move this over here. The Gemara says, what is the situation of Achashosh and Haman analogous to? It's analogous to two people. One of them had a mound, and one of them had a ditch. The owner of the ditch said, eh, cause I, if only I had some dirt, I would pay for it. The owner of the dirt said, if only I had a ditch, I would pay to put my dirt in the ditch. One day, they bump into each other. So the owner of the ditch said, the owner of the mound, sell me your dirt. The owner of the dirt said, I don't need to sell it to you. Just take it off my hands. So too, Achazeres had a problem with the Jews. He had too many Jews. Haman wanted to kill the Jews. So he would pay, so Haman tells Achazeres, I'll pay you for the rights to kill the Jews. Achazeres says, do me a favor, keep the money and, t- and get them off my hands. Why did Achashosh want to kill the Jews? Achashosh is Molach Bekipa. He had no intention of ridding the world of North Koreans, of Armenians, of Africans. Why is Achashosh such an anti-Semite? Haman, I understand. He's an Amaleki. It's in his blood. It's in his DNA. But Achashosh is a Persian. What do the Persians have against us? That Achashosh should tell Haman, you know what? Just get them off my hands. Do me a favor. I'm not interested in them. I mean, isn't that bizarro? Why would, why would Achashverosh hate? I mean, he's the king of the world. If he's going to start exterminating nationalities, it's not going to be, uh, his malchus will not last long. Especially in light of the fact that his own father was the one who gave permission to the Jewish people to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. So, why, why does he hate the Jews? And we'll add to the question, question number five, the Jews were very loyal to him. They were loyal servants of the Persian kings. Daniel grew up, was groomed in the palace of Koresh. Other officers of the king were all the attendants of Yehuda. And they were all loyal, and they had no deceit, and there were no imperfe- imperfection, and they were trustworthy. We know Daniel, Hananiah, Mishal, Vazariah, Koresh loved Jews so much, he was the one who gave permission to rebuild the second Mesa Mikdash. So, in light of the fact that the Jewish people were ex- uh, especially loyal to Achashverosh, why did Achashverosh hate them? And now we encounter another very unusual phenomenon. Namely, it says that what did Mordechai do with his newfound gedula? Says Reb Pinchas, Mordechai ruled over the Jews. Just like a king wears royalty and robes, Mordechai wore robes. Just like a king wears a crown, Mordechai wore a crown. Just like a a king instills, inspires fear, Mordechai inspired fear. Just like a king mints coins, Mordechai minted coin. What was Mordechai's coin? His coin was Mordechai on one side, Esther on the other side. Question. Why did Mordechai want to be a king? Why Why would Achashosh make Mordechai a king? I don't know, you know, that's really strange. Imagine if someone saves the life of the president. Would the president say, okay, you saved my life. I'm going to let you you fly in Air Force One. I'm going to let you ride in my motor uh, uh, transportation. And not only that, I'm going to let you give the presidential address. 
Imagine if, you know, you turn on uh, to hear State of the Union Address, and who is it? Some, some no-name guy. What, what are you doing? Oh, I, I saved the king, I saved the president, so I'm giving the State of the Union Address. I mean, this Akashur has very bizarre ideas. It's very nice he wants to reward someone for uh, saving his life. But why make Mordechai a king? I could think of many ways to reward someone. R- cut him a check. Give him a gift certificate. Let him, I don't know what. Why, ma- let, why have him mint coins? I mean, isn't that unusual? So question number six is, why did Achashverosh make Mordechai a king? Question number seven. So Esther says, Vatoimer Esther is Sarve Oyev, Haman Hora, Hazev, Haman Nivas, Lafe Hamelech, Hamaka, Vehamelech, Kamakosavish, Aginas, Vehamelech Shav. And all of a sudden, um, Harvoyna says, You know, I have a great idea. Ga Mineho Eitz, and the Vayom Ramach, Tulu Allah. So Achashir turns to Esther and he says, in number 11, Question. All of a sudden, when I, after Achazers wanted to exterminate and annihilate the Jewish people, yesterday he was Hitler, and today... Oh, you're a Jew? I love the Yiddalach. They're so zis. They're so cute. They're so honest. I want to do business with them. I want to promote them. I don't understand. The day before he was setting up concentration camps to eradicate the Jewish people, and all of a sudden today, he's the Jewish people's best friend. I mean, this guy needs serious psychiatric assistance. I never in my life saw somebody more Excuse the expression, I'm not even going to say it. I mean, he cannot make up his mind. Yesterday, yesterday, he wants to annihilate the Jewish people. Today, do whatever you want. So what exactly changed? What is this newfound, sudden love for the Jewish people? Question number eight. The Gemara tells us, on the Pasuk, at the end of Megillah Sester, Ki Mardechai HaYehudi Mishnah L'Amelcha Chashvei Roish V'Galdar L'Yehudi Meratsoi L'Roi V'Chav Most people like Mordechai. Why? That's as good as you're going to get if you're a rabbi. And uh, that's pretty good. Doi Reish Tohiv Li'amoi V'doi Ver Shalom L'Chol Zaroi So Mordechai, he's on top of the world. However, the Gemara Darshans, Not everyone liked him. Some of the Sanhedrin separated from him. Why? Because he was involved in Askonos, saving lives, and he went down in Madrega. The question is, what? Mordechai saves the Jewish people, and now the Gedolim don't like him? So Rav Yonis and Ibishitz explains as follows. That... Mordechai, as mentioned, became a melech. And because he, make, he became a melech, as mentioned, he was minting coins. But the halacha is that you cannot be a member of the Sanhedrin if you're a melech. And therefore the Sanhedrin separated from him. But the question is, so then why would Mordechai want to be a melech? Why did Mordechai put himself in a situation where he sort of disqualifies himself as a member of the Sanhedrin? Baruch I mean, the story goes that Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zechazag Levracha, didn't want to have a certain pacemaker put in because he was afraid it would render him a Baumum and then he wouldn't be able to be part of the Sanhedrin. So why would Mordechai allow himself and assume the role of Melech and he's no longer qualified to serve on the Sanhedrin? We know Ein Moishivin Melech the Sanhedrin. Why did Mordechai accept that role? Question number eight. 
And question number nine. Did anyone here ever see... I know many of you have G'doylem pictures. I have G'doylem pictures behind me. You have Ramosha and Rabat Bavadia Yosef. But I would never give you the Zuchus to see the other pictures in my office. Maybe I'll, I'll let you see one day. I have a picture of Chaim Knievsky on the left wall. Straight ahead, I have Rabbi Vadia. I have Rabbi Vigdor Miller. I have Rabbi Henach Libowitz, I have a lot of G'doylem pictures. But the question is, Rabbi Isai, do you have Rishon pictures? Yeah, I want to know if you have a Rishon picture collection. So I can't tell you whether I have a picture of Rishon, but I have seen what Haman looks like. On all the cartoons, Haman is an ugly guy. He, he's, in, he's just not a nice looking dude. He has a long uh, nose. Everybody knows that Haman had a very long nose. And he had like a triangular head. That's why he wore that Hamantashen hat. And he just not was, was not a pleasant guy. I mean, I, I hate to say this, you know. He just, well, I, don't, I don't like to be negative. But Haman was not a good looking person. And why did Achishosh like the man? The man was sinister. He was filthy. He was sly. He was slimy. Why did Achishosh like this guy? What was this relationship that Achishosh had with Haman. Why did Achishosh like Haman? That Achishosh made Haman second in command? I mean, not only did he like him, he took off his ring and he gave Haman his ring. Why would Achishosh give a sleazy guy like Haman his tabas? What did Achishosh need him for? Achishosh needed Haman? Achishosh is the king of the world. What does he need Haman for? And more, and finally, Rabbi Sai. The Pasuk says in Yeshaya, Tachas Hanatsuts Yalev Eroyish. By the way, this is a Creek Siv. It's Kesiv. Sachas Hasirpad Yale Hadas, but it's Kri. Visachas Hasirpad Yale Hadas. Vehaya Lashem Lashem. Leoi Soy Laham Loi Kares. So the Gemara Darshans. That Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmini would always start off his discussion on the Megillah from here. Tachas Hanatzutz Yale Peroish. The Naatzutz is Haman. Instead of Haman, who was a Naatzutz, an Avedazara, arose Peroish, the Cyprus. This is Mordechai, who was Roish Lechol Habesamim. Instead of the Sirpad, who was Vashti. Who burnt Rafidas Beis Hashem? Yale Hadas. This is Esther, the Tzadekes, who is called Hadasa. Vehoya Lashem Lashem. And it was a name for God, Zu Mikra Megillah. God made a name for himself through the reading of the Megillah. Question Really? God made a name of his, uh, for himself through reading the Megillah? Oh, uh, probably in the Megillah, God's name appears many, many, many times if God made a name for Himself with Mikra Megillah. And what do you know? Sure enough, the book with which God made a name for Himself, His name doesn't appear. What's going on over here? If you would have told me God made a name for Himself with Koheles, with Eicha, with Rus, I could understand. But the worst book to choose... To say that God made a name for Himself is Mikra Megillah. How did God make a name for Himself with Mikra Megillah? So, my Rabbi, I want to share with you the approach of the Rebbe, Rabbi Yonison, Ibishitz, the great Rosh Hashiva, Baldarshan, author of Yarei Stavash on Megillah Sester. On Yaroslavash is a collection of his drashos, but much of the sefer is about Megillah Sester and Mesechus Megillah. And we know that on that fateful night, that Achashurish could not sleep, he was having a dream. And in his dream, he sees Haman taking a, a sword to kill him. And he suddenly awakens and he tells his scribes, bring the book of remembrance to read, to see what it says in it. And they opened up the book and they found the matter that Mordechai 
saved the king's life and he never repaid him. We see that the kings were very attuned to their chalaymais. However, Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz reveals that if you look in the ancient works of history, especially, especially Josephus, it was common practice that there was one thing that kings always wanted to know. And this is something that always was a source of stress and anxiety to kings. And that is they always wanted to know who will be the next king. Because how could they have any menucha? How could they have any... How could their throne be established if in the back of their mind, well, maybe someone will assassinate them. Maybe someone has their eyes on the throne. And sure enough, Ahasuerus communicated with his Kisamim and Chaldeim and Hoivrei Shamayim and Balei Kishof that the next king of Persia will be a Jew. And this scared the living daylights out of Ahasuerus. Because how could he sit comfortably on his throne knowing that the Jews somehow will assassinate him and they will appoint the next king. And he figures to himself what will happen. The Jews will rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. They'll rebuild the temple. And they will gain world dominion. And then the Melech Yisrael will rule over Persia. So while Haman hated the Jews inherently as a true anti-Semite, he recognized, what the, like Hitler, what the Jew represents in the world, that we, we are the conscience of the world. Hashem just uh, gave me a matana. You know, I was speaking to the Mayo this morning at the Bris, and I asked the Mayo, what's the Indian la Yehudim hoisa oira v'simcha v'sasoin v'kar? And the Gemara Darshans, oira... Zu Taira. Simcha Zu Yamtif. Sasain Zu Mila. Vikar Zu Tfilin. In what way was the Bris Mila restored to the Jewish people because of the Purim story? Was Mila restored to the Jewish people? Do we find anywhere that Haman was specifically connected the Bris Mila? We know that Amalek in general, in Beshalach, they were Zarak, Milasai, Vizarkai, Klape, Maila. But where do we find Haman was against Bris Mila? The answer is, Haman was like the fatherhead of Germany, of all anti Semites, of Hitler. And we know Hitler claimed that the Jewish people inflicted two imperfections of the world, on the world. The bris mila was the imperfection of the body. And the conscience was the imperfection of character. And he said, we're going to free the world from the imperfection of the Jew. Because we Germans, we are barbarians without conscience. And we will revert back to being barbarians when we eradicate the Jewish people. So the same way Hitler was against the mila, apparently Haman was also against the mila. In any event, Marv Rabbi like a good anti-Semite, Hitler wanted to eradicate the Jewish people, but Achashverosh had his own agenda. He didn't hate the Jewish people inherently, but through witchcraft he understood the Jewish people will usurp his throne. So in order to ensure and assure the permanence of his throne, he wanted to make sure the Jews would never rebuild the base Hamikdash. Because if they have no temple, then God's throne is incomplete. If God's throne is incomplete, that means there's no malchus for Yisrael, and His malchus will be eternal. The Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin and Adaf Chaf, and the Ramam codifies this in the very beginning of Hilchos Malachim, that upon entry into the land of Israel, we're commanded to do three things. To appoint a king, to destroy Amalek, to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash, which implies we cannot rebuild the Beis HaMikdash so long as Amalek's in the world. So Achashverosh elevates, promotes Haman, not because he likes Haman, he despises Haman. He understands Haman is an evil, sly, slick, slimy, deceitful, long-nosed, ugly man. 
But so long as Haman is around, the Jews can't build the base Hamikdash. And the more Haman is promoted, the more he diminishes Malchus Shamayim, and the more he diminishes the possibility of Malchus Yisrael. So he didn't like Haman. Haman was just his assurance to maintain his Malucha. That's why he promoted Haman. That's why he made Haman Melech. Because the more elevated Amalek is, the more likely the temple will never be rebuilt, the more likely his Malchus is established. He saw the next king of Persia will be a Jew. So in order to protect himself, he said, okay, Esther, I don't know who you are, what you are, but I will give you anything. But nobody's touching my Malchus, and therefore, Ad Chatsi Amalchus. There never will be a Beis HaMikdash. And why does he want to kill the Jews? He doesn't hate the Jews inherently. He's just worried, based on his news briefing and his report, that the next king of Persia will be a Jew, so the only way to assure his continuity is eradicating the Jewish people. So Haman looked at us like a ditch, like a hole, inherently lacking. Ahasuerus looked at us like a mound. He understood our greatness, but our greatness was getting in the way of his greatness. So he wants to kill the Jews. Not that he didn't trust us. He knew we were loyal to him. But as far as he's concerned, our destiny and his destiny clashed. But we all know that even though he was attempting to eradicate the Jewish people in order to ensure his continuity, but we know that when there is a sign in the astrological stars that something will happen, you cannot completely cancel the, its possibility of coming to fruition. Like when Paroi saw in his dream, Paroi saw there was blood in store for the Jewish people in the Midbar. Of course, that referred to the Damila. Paroi thought it referred to the annihilation of the Jewish people in the Midbar. But that blood had to come out in some way or in some form. So, Akashash also re- recognized that. That if in his astrological sign he saw the next king of Persia would be a Jew, in a way there's no way around it. So he had a great idea, he had an Einfall. He said, maybe I could fulfill the, bring the dream to fruition by making Ach- uh, Mordechai king for a day. If Mordechai is king for a day and he rides the royal horse and he wears the royal garment and he mints coins so then the dream that the next king of Persia will be a Jew it will be fulfilled to some extent through this one day in the sun that I'm giving Mordechai because he was still afraid that in the back of the mind this dream has to come to fruition in some way, shape or form. And that's the reason, says Rabbi Yonason Ibishitz, why Achashverosh promoted Mordechai. But says Rabbi Yonason Ibishitz, on that fateful day, when Esther said, Ish tsar ve'oyev haman hara hazeh And Esther, so Achashverosh says, So who are you? What are you? And she says, Asher said, You're a Jew? I never knew you were a Jew. Well, if you're a Jew, then our kid Darius, he's also a Jew. Oh, so the next king of Persia could be my son and could be a Jew, and it's not a threat to me. I'm no longer threatened by the premonition of the dream that the next king of Persia will be a Jew, okay? I never liked Taman anyway. He has a long nose. He looks like an ugly dude. He's slimy. He's grimy. He's deceitful. I can't trust him with a penny. I don't like him anyway. I only liked him because it suited my agenda. But I was mistaken from the beginning. I thought the Jews would usurp my throne. I never knew you were a Jew. And I didn't know my kid was a Jew. Now my kid is a Jew. I could have nice Yiddish Anachas from Dar Yavesh. He'll be the next king of Persia. 
and uh, Shalom al Persia. Everything will be hunky dory. So that's why Achashir didn't hate the Jewish people, Be'atzem. It wasn't inherent. It's only that our grandeur was getting in the way of his destiny. But now that he realizes Haman wanted to kill us, but Esther was a Jew and his kid was a Jew, and his kid will be the next one in line in the throne. Memela, he has nothing to worry about. Says Rabbi Anasin Ibishitz, that is how Hashem made a name for himself with Mikra Megillah. Namely, that so long as Amalek is in the world, God's name is diminished, is mitigated. But when Amalek is destroyed, then the Kisei HaKavod is fulfilled, and the name of Hashem is Beshlemos, and Vahaya Lashem Lashem Zu Mikra Megillah. So we asked, why does Achashver start off the party? Celebrating. Why does the story begin that Achashver is celebrating? That the Beis HaMegish will never be rebuilt. Why does Achashver care if the Beis HaMegish is rebuilt or not? The answer is, to Achashver, the Beis HaMikdash meant Jewish autonomy, Jewish sovereignty, Jewish monarchy, and ultimately his downfall because of his dream. So he, when the 70 years are up and the Beis HaMegish is not rebuilt, he's celebrating the establishment and the and the solid ground that his malchus is based upon. And that's why we asked so, uh, um, why he wanted to kill the Jews, because they were getting in his way. Even though typically they were loyal to him, it wasn't a matter of loyalty, it was a matter of his destiny. And that's why he made Mordechai a king for a day, to fulfill the dream that the next king of Persia would be a Jew, in some small measure. And that's why suddenly when he realized his own kid was a Jew, he loved the Jews. And this explains why how uh, the king made Haman king, uh, second in command, because the more elevated Amalek is, the less likely and possible it is for the base of Megdash ever to be destroyed. And that's why Achashver always mentioned to Esther, I'll give you whatever you want, but not the Beis HaMikdash. Not that he suspected that she would ask for it, but it was important for him to let, let it know. He was basically saying, I'll give you whatever you want, but I am not jeopardizing in any way anything that will threaten my throne. And that which threatens my throne more than anything else is Binyan Beis HaMikdash. But once Haman reveals himself that... I'm sorry, once Haman is hanged and Esther reveals herself, so he's done with this rhetoric about he'll never rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. Now he has no problem rebuilding Beis HaMikdash. Now we understand why Mordechai wanted to be a Melech, Rabbi Isai. You know why Mordechai wanted to be a Melech? Because in order to destroy Amalek and rebuild the Beis HaMikdash, you need to be a Melech. As the Ramam says, Three things were commanded upon entry to Eretz Yisrael to establish a Melech, to destroy Amalek, and to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. So Mordechai understood, in order to destroy Amalek, he has to have the status of being a Melech. So he minted coins. And it was Kedai for Mordechai to assume the role of Melech to destroy Amalek, even at the expense of no longer being able to be part of the Sanhedrin. By the way, Rabbi David Tevel says that the reason why the second Beis HaMikdash lacked five things that the first Beis HaMikdash had, it didn't have the Urim Betumim, it didn't have the Arain, it didn't have the Eish Min HaShamayim, it didn't have the Shechina, it didn't have Rech HaKodesh. You know why it was lacking in these things, especially Shechina? Because in order to build a base of Mikdash, you need to destroy Amalek. In order to destroy Amalek, you need to have a din of a Melech. Shaul and David, that really had the full status of Melech, were able to destroy Amalek as much as humanly possible, and they were able to have the Kedusha of a Mikdash as much as possible. However, however, Mordechai was not a full king. It was king for a day. It was appointed by Achashverosh. It wasn't Bishlemos. So since his Malchus was lacking, his ability to destroy Amalek was lacking, the status of the second Mesa HaMikdash was lacking. So, answering our ten questions in order. Why would Achashverosh 
Why does Achshosh have to keep on saying, I'm not going to build a base of Mikdash? Because the base of Mikdash is a thorn in his Malchus. It stops him. He was worried having a base of Mikdash meant that one day his Malchus would cease. That's why after Esther reveals herself, he no longer says anything about the base of Mikdash. And that's why Achshosh is happy in the beginning of the story. Question number three. What, that the base of Mikdash is not built, because it's not built, that means his Malchus will last longer. That's why he wants to kill the Jews, question number four. Why they stood in the way of his sovereignty. E, and especially, in, even though they were o- always loyal to him, nevertheless, they were a thorn in his side. Question number six, why make Mordechai a king? To fulfill in some measure the dream. Question number seven, why did he suddenly love the Jews? The answer is he never really hated us intrinsically. It's just that he was threatened by us. That threat ceased when he realized his own son was a Jew. That is why Mordechai wanted to be the king in order to destroy Amalek. That was question number eight. Question number nine, the re- why did Ahasuerus make Haman a melech, a Mishnah a melech? Because promoting Amalek meant that the Mikdash would not be rebuilt. And of course, Vahaya Lashem Lashem. Through the reading of Mikra Megillah, even though God's name is not mentioned, we destroy Amalek and we fulfill, we are Mashlim, the name of Hashem. Hopefully, next week, Monday, uh, Tainas Esther, we could get together uh, briefly. Wishing everyone a wonderful week. Bracha Vahatzlacha, Kal Tov Salah. Have a good day. Bracha Kal Tov. Yeah. That was like a real puzzle solver. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.